This is Billy Kay with the history of Scottish nationalism told from within the movement, The Cause, Programme 2, 3 or a Desert. I'm standing on the field of Bonnie Muir, where the radical rising erupted in 1820, and the armed insurgents who came here vowed they would achieve liberty or death. They were part of a radical nationalist tradition going back to the 1790s when the Friends of the People and the United Scotsmen advocated social reform and the restoration of a Scottish Parliament. When the Weavers came out in 1820, they did so under a banner with the words Scotland free or a desert. An organisation called the United Scotsmen had existed. One of their members was one James Wilson, a weaver from Straven. A man and by that time in his 60s came stomping out in 1820 with his banner, Scotland free or a desert, said. And he paid for that with his life. Working class radicals James Wilson, John Baird and Andrew Hardy hung and beheaded as traitors by the British state yet revered as martyrs for the cause of Scottish democracy in the music of young Sarah McNeill. At the 1820 Society's commemoration at Bonnie Muir, I spoke to Ian Bain, Tommy Craney and Michael Donnelly. The significance really of Bonnie Muir is just part of a huge rising which affected the whole of the industrial west of Scotland with about 30 to 60,000, depending on the various estimates, of workers downing tools. It was the first industrial general strike in the world. And three men were hung and beheaded yeah. for it, ultimately. What was their motivation? What was the prime motivation? Well, it's about democracy, and of course, in a Scottish context, it's about Scottish democracy. And we could say that this was the start of a process whereby the ordinary people of Scotland decided that it was time for them to have a say in the running of their country. And of course, we could argue that uh, the logical conclusion of that is, in the Scottish context, that you have a Scottish national self-determination. And so these men set a Scottish agenda, which we have yet to complete. Scottish national identity and culture were uh, obviously a subtext to everything that went on. But the tendency is to ignore the fact that this was the founding of democracy. And one of the sad things at the moment is, if you look around about here, I think only the province, the Falkirk, and myself are probably the members of the Labour Party. The whole identity has become a nationalist one which really doesn't represent the totality of it, you know. They now, were both tied in together, weren't they? The idea of national self-determination and democracy. Absolutely. And you've got Thomas Muir, I think arguably the founder of the Labour movement in Scotland. And, of course, the weavers were what you might call the foot soldiers. They were the followers. So I think there's just a lack of context. It doesn't mean there's any great differences between people on it. Is that because of the tension between the Labour movement and the nationalist movement in the present day? Absolutely. It's like caught up in a contemporary political battle because there's not really any real contradiction. The whole tying in of the idea of independence it was certainly an important element, and especially on the Straven banner, of which they have a replica here, uh, saying the word Scotland free or a desert. Literally, those were the, the kind of alternatives that working people thought they were faced with. And that bled into the later movements. There was a nationalist element in the Chartist movement. But from 1792 through to 1820, the idea of an independent Scottish Republic is always there as a central plan of the radical platform. The paranoia of the period was revealed when a band was arrested in Airdrie for playing this tune, Scots Wahey. So more than a hundred years after the Union, Scottish national identity was still a potent force among the masses and the elites, even though they were profiting from their role in the empire and saw no tension between being British and Scottish. By the later part of the 19th century, however, the mood was changing. 
writer Tom Nairn, Richard Findlay and James Mitchell of Strathclyde University. There has been a sense of Scottish identity for centuries and that is the basis of modern nationalism. But in terms of a political movement and where it got impetus, I think it came in reaction to perceptions that Scotland and Scottish identity was in danger. They were going to be obliterated, that Britishness was taking over, there would be no room for a Scottish identity. If you think about how the Scots were in the 19th century, I mean, they were arrogance personified, you know. If it wasn't for us, the hopeless English wouldn't have their empire. They needed us to do everything for them and we were better educated. They actually rejoiced in the fact that there was a net flow of money from Scotland to Britain. But in the interwar period and after that, unionism became very sort of, kind of negative in a way. And that's where you get the idea of the dependency culture, that Scotland simply couldn't survive on its own. You know, It may have run the empire, but you know, they couldn't run themselves. Do you think it was the lack of a political dimension that produced this lack of confidence? Yes, broadly speaking, I think it was. But it was politics in a deep sense, a sense of deeper attitudes, of secure ability to establish one's place in the wider world, which the Scots abandoned for all sorts of good reasons. There's a book about it called A Union for Empire. You know? It seemed a good bargain at the time. It was only later, with the end of imperialism, really, and uh, the shrinkage of the British realm, as it were, that made people more aware of the need for alternatives. What we've got going on is an Irish question, and that hugely influenced the Scottish question and the sense that Ireland was being favoured actually upset many Scots, that the Scottishness was being marginalised at the expense of time in Parliament and resources going into Ireland. So in a sense, modern Scottish nationalism was in some respects a reaction to Irish nationalism as much as anything else. The Scots National League back then was much more in favour of a Celtic twilight idea but then it became much more orientated to become a party. The Scottish Home Rule Association was much more in favour of campaigns, conventions. It was there to convert Labour. They were more centre-left, more formed with ILP people. The Labour Party's origins, say a man like Keir Hardy, for instance, for whom a key founding principle of his movement was home rule for Scotland. And the Labour Party currently just do not seem to even acknowledge that. There's always been that quite strong strand of Scottish nationalism within the Labour Party. Many of those who advocated the Scottish Parliament within the Labour Party, within the ILP, were essentially advocating independence, not home rule. And that sat uneasily alongside another element within the Labour Party, which was very hostile to home rule, that believed in the central state. For socialists like Derek Maguire, from a Fife mining background, there's still the feeling that the Labour Party has left him and lost its roots. I tweeted Tom Harris and I asked him if he had any plans made for the aftermath of a yes vote on independence. And he replied, no, haven't made any. Why bother? I've got some PG Woodhouse I'd like to catch up on. And I couldn't believe this. It just made me wonder how they reconcile their current stance with their roots and where they came from. Because their founding fathers were as firmly in favour of Home Rule for Scotland as their opponents in the SNP. And there's times, talk about Berlin and folks' graves, I don't know if Keir Hardy's should be fitted with a rev counter. <laughs> when I joined the SNP at university, I came home and told my father I've just joined the SNP. And he said, you're a traitor to the working class. <laughs> my father had supported the early Labour when they wanted home rule. And of course, I knew all kinds of old famous guys. And the Labour Party, the Labour Party hated my connections. <laughs> Couldn't bear it. Because not only had I got their seat, but I'd also got splendid connections. Winnie Ewing, whose father, like my own, was old Labour. But the old order was changing, and the man who founded the Scottish Labour Party with Keir Hardy in 1888, R.B. Cunningham Graham, by 1928 had come out for Scottish independence and challenged his countrymen. The enemies of Scottish nationalism are not the English, he wrote, for they were ever a great and generous folk quick to respond when justice calls. Our real enemies are among us born without imagination. The late Muriel Gibson remembered him. 
I joined the National Party in 1932, and the annual highlight was going to Bannockburn. At the head of the procession, marching through Stirling, was this man on horseback, Cunningham Graham. Of course, he was a born rider, and he always looked out of time, if you know what I mean. I could have imagined him quite easily as a cavalier. He just had a very special aura around him. He was slim, he was very aristocratic looking, and altogether an absolutely romantic figure. Don Roberto personifies this idea of a Scottish patriot. He fulfills the role of the adventurer, he goes to Latin America, he lives the, the gaucho life. Uh, he also becomes a great literary figure, comes back to Scotland, helps establish a Labour Party, but then in turn becomes a founder member of the Nationalist Party, where again demonstrating that internationalism and nationalism go together. I think the 1920s and 30s, we see a growing frustration amongst the home rulers. And so you get that reaction, it's really to the failure of the 1928 Home Rule Bill, that you see the, the rise of the separate political party. But that was very much in reaction to the sense that the old route of gaining support through the Labour Party just wasn't delivering home rule. The ancestor of the Scottish National Party is the National Party of Scotland, which was formed in 1928. It then merged in what I believe was an understandable but not very helpful association with a thing called the Scottish Party, which was just people who didn't have the defiant streak in them to join the National Party, who were socially a wee thing up the ladder and also well heeled, And they joined the Scottish Party as a kind of change from flower arranging or something like that. And unwisely, the National Party merged with them. And that, of course, tended to take an awful lot of the edge off the campaigning, that they formed the Scottish National Party in 1934 as a result of that merger. The Scottish Party is less favourable to independence, and the National Party for Scotland, the other half that, that merges, well, they're much more in favour of it. So in that sense, it's already at the birth of the SNP, there is that kind of debate about what is it exactly that we want, and they have to deal with that because they're trying to attract these two parties into one. Peter Lynch of Stirling University and Jimmy Halliday on the disparate elements who began modern political nationalism. Among them was Christopher Murray Grieve, Hugh McDermott, who wrote, A Scottish poet mun assume the burden o' his people's doom and dee to break their leaving tomb. Fergus Ewing. My goodness, could we row, could we argue? Was it John McCormick said that the problems of the SNP began the day it took on its second member? <laughs> I think he was referring to Hugh McDermott, actually. <laughs> the founding of the National Party is very, very important. And there's an interesting photograph of that founding. The Duke of Montrose is there, Compton Mackenzie's there, Cunningham Graham's there. Hugh McDermott's there, and John McCormick and James Valentine, who are student politicians, of course, at Glasgow University. At least three of those figures are eminent writers in Scotland. And much of the nationalist discourse that emerged, emerged in writing, but it didn't only emerge in writing. And it was chiefly under McDermott who wanted to ensure that the visual component of Scottish nationalism was fully expressed. So McDermott becomes enormously important in politicising Scottish visual art in the 1920s. Tom Normand of St Andrews University on the nationalist impulse behind artists like William Johnson, William McCanns and J.D. Ferguson, who valued Scotland's old alliance links with France. Indeed, it was a Frenchman, Denis Sora, who first encapsulated this age in the term la Renaissance écossaise, the Scottish Renaissance. Artists aside, though, Guy Few were joining the cause. I was 17 before I met another nationalist. It was not an issue at that time. It was just not thought of. I know as a family we were very often looked upon as having two heads, you know. They would pass our house and see the sticker on the gate, Home Rule for Scotland, and I was at primary school at the time, and really we were regarded as very odd. And here we are, we've come full circle. <laughs> it's wonderful. Flora McCormick, 
The party's one and only electoral success in those days was the by-election victory by Dr Robert McIntyre in Motherwell in 1945. Student Jim Halliday was encased in a plaster shell in a hospital spinal unit when he heard the news. I was noisily celebrating and across the ward there was one Ted Argent, a big English marine. But Ted took exception to my celebration and he wanted to fight. <laughs> So the pair of us were throwing challenges across the ward. And then later on, Ted and I came <laughs> once again challenging one another because in the 1945 general election, Labour government was elected. And I celebrated that too because Labour was committed to home rule. And Ted, who as well as being an English nationalist, was also, of course, a good unbiased Tory, and he once again wanted to knock my head off. <laughs> so were you lying there like a mummy almost? I was lying there with a plaster shell on. <laughs> but there could have been an Anglo-Scottish war if you'd both been fit. <laughs> there could have been. I suspect it was very much to my good luck that I, we weren't fit, because as an ex-Marine, I wouldn't like to go into the <laughs> ring with any ex-Marine, to be honest. During the war itself, the party's chairman, Douglas Young, refused conscription into the British Army, but most members joined the fight against fascism. After the war, another leading light, John McCormick, tried a different approach, Marion and Ian McCormick. I think my father thought at that stage, with this relative fragmentation, that it would be a great idea you to have a non-party political national movement. And that's how the Scottish Convention began, and that's what underlay the Scottish Covenant. Every time an election came along, the unionist argument was, oh, well, if you want independence, you'll vote for it. Vote SNP. Look what happens. You get sort of single-figure percentages. You're just a waste of everybody's time. And so his answer to that was to look for a consensus and say to people, do you also believe that Scotland should govern itself? And if you say yes, put that first. At the time, it swept Scotland. And I, as a young person, was well aware of that because all sorts of people, whom I knew, were signing this covenant who certainly weren't what one could have described as Scottish nationalists. That was his great moment when he set up the covenant and had all these signatories, starting with the Duke of Montrose. He was the first signatory, my father was the second. And that was definitely one of the things my father believed in, that we all were together in these things. And he mentions that he was from a crofting background, coming straight after the Lord of the Manor, if you like. And he felt that was very representative of Scotland. The Scottish Covenant bound all those who signed it to put the Scottish Home Rule above all other political issues when they came to vote. And something like two million people signed the trouble was, as I said bitterly, in all the years ever since then, all that proved was that there are close on two million liars in Scotland because they did not implement the pledge that they took when they signed the Covenant. Would some people regard you as very harsh saying that? I would, but there is a place for people being forced to confront their illogicalities, their pusillanimity, if that's the right word. But they must have thought that was some achievement to get two million signatures oh, for was, Scottish Home Rule. It was a room. tremendous achievement and my harshness would not extend to criticising their activity because they left an mm. awareness of the issue. I would never withhold from John McCormick the praise and the gratitude that he deserves for having done that. He left a tremendous legacy. They were the most intellectual party by far. There was all these good debates at Glasgow University and the SNP always had a great support in debating. Do you remember John McCormack? I remember him very well because he was the Lord Rector that we voted for. Oh, he was marvellous. I would say the gift of tongues, John McCormack. And McCormack also attracted celebrities to his rectorial campaign, among them an iconic actor with an iconic soul. We cooks for a sat in a tree. 
A wee coke spar a shot in a tree. A wee coke spar a shot in a tree. Chirpin' a wall, as blithe as could be. Along came a boy with a bow and an ara. Along came a boy with a bow and an ara. Along came a boy with a bow and an ara. And he said, I'll get you, you wee coke spar that was the first time that he had offered this up to any audience. Eventually, McCree was doing this turn on television and radio and so on, but that was his beginning, the Union in Glasgow, 1950. Not to be outdone, there were also nationalist stirrings at Edinburgh University, where increasingly people saw the movement in international terms. Professor Alan McInnes of Strathclyde University, Jim Lynch and Gordon Wilson. In Edinburgh, it was the Scottish Nationalist Club. And in a way, it tied us in with the anti-imperial movement. So that when it came to the big demonstration in 1956 over the Suez crisis, the overseas country students came out and joined in that protest. The importance of the Palestine experience to many Scots after the Second World War. I mean, you have Sean Machcola, you know, Rata Mashaw Hashim, too long in this condition, uh, his writings. He was actually influenced then. Also, Robin Jenkins has a Palestinian experience, and that moved him towards a greater notion of Scottish patriotism. I did national service, and I did it in the Black Watch. And we used to sing old Scots songs, having had a few beers, singing about my granny's heel and him. And my granny was Irish and lived in a tenement in Dundee. <laughs> I think a lot of what solidified internationalism was in fact when I was doing my national service. I felt that was a kind of surrogate nationalism. Because it's usually thought the opposite in a way, that Aye, the, the experience of fighting, especially during the Second World War, created a strong British identity for a few yeah. generations. I would think that would be true during that period. But of course, that was in, if you like, the post-Empire period, yeah. chasing African nationalists through the hills kind of thing, you know. There's no doubt at all that from the experience of, of being part of that independence movement, which my grandfather was part of and my great-grandfather were both part of, that's definitely influenced my father and I suppose that influences me and I've got no doubt I'll probably end up influencing any children I have in the future. So undoubtedly, that came from the experience that he had in the subcontinent. Hamza Yousaf, MSP, whose family experienced successful independence movements in Kenya, India and Pakistan. Back home in 1950, a group of student nationalists led by Ian Hamilton and orchestrated by John McCormack decided to stage a spectacular, the liberation of the Stone of Destiny from Westminster Abbey. That was a fantastic event. Muckle enjoyed by Scots, no like by the English. Kay Matheson, who was the one chosen, had the ability to drive a car, being a Highland girl. I was really ruled out because of the driving. And would you have been up for it? Oh, yes. No doubt about it. I remember meeting him in Sucky Horse Street as Christmas 1950 came near, and he had a big brown paper parcel with a crowbar <laughs> protruding from one end. I looked at this and I looked at him, and he said, smiling, not intending to be convincing, oh, he says, it's my father's. Oh, I said he's in the burglary business, is he? <laughs> oh, the team, no Westminster was a powerful man. He held all the strings of the state in his hand. And all this great power it flustered in vain. Till some rogues ran away with his wee magic sting. We are to rely, you rely, you rely. Knew the state had great powers that could do such a thing. For what it did, it seemed we'd be wanting a king. So he called in the polis and gave this decree. Go and hunt it the stain and return it to me. We are to rely, you rely, you rely. Christmas Day in 1950, my father very solemnly came into the drawing room where we were all gathered. I want everyone to listen to the one o'clock news. The historic coronation stone, the stone of Schoon, was stolen from Westminster Abbey early today. It was pulled from beneath the coronation chair and then dragged to the door at Poet's Corner, which had been broken open. Did he have a dry smile on his face? Or what did he look like when he heard the news? Yeah, the broadest smile I've ever seen on his face. <laughs> <laughs> what about your mother? She was terrified. <laughs> she told this story of how on Christmas Day she was stirring the soup in the kitchen when my father came through and said, come on through, Margaret. It's news time. We better go and listen to it. And she's saying... I have a house full of family. How can I possibly listen to the news? No, no, come through, come through. 
So, of course, she went through and heard that the stone had been stolen and immediately scurried back to the kitchen. He came through full of smiles and, isn't that fantastic, isn't that fantastic? And she said, no, and I know exactly who's behind it. That was what she was worried about, that he would end up in the jail and she had four children at home to bring up. As a primary school teacher, and I was at Crimean Primary School at the time in Aberdeenshire, told us the stain had gone back and grat. Now that made an awful impression on me. And I, I keep thinking back to that day, that that was able as a turning point, that really planted a seed that I'll never forget. You could see the tears coming down, she was that moved that the stain had gone back, because she obviously didn't have wanted to go back to England. Peter Wright on the handing back of the Stone of Destiny, which finally did win him to Scotland in 1996. But if the 1950s started with a bang, they went out with a whimper, with the SNP still very much on the fringes of Scottish consciousness. The first conference that I chaired in 1956 had its collective photograph taken on the steps of the Allen Water Hotel in Bridge of Allen. There was plenty of room on the steps of that one modest country hotel for the entire representation of the Scottish National Party at its annual conference. Its quarterly national councils used to meet in one room in the Golden Lion Hotel in Stirling. And the votes added up to a total attendance of about 30. There would be at most 10 branches in Scotland. So there was such a need to expand as a matter of urgency before you could be taken seriously at all. By the late 50s, there was a perception that Scottish nationalism was essentially dead. There were a couple of very significant articles in the Glasgow Herald in 1959 that did write the obituary of nationalism. Arthur Donaldson used to claim that we only had a thousand members. And I used to say to him, Arthur, you're an exaggerating old scoundrel. There would be perhaps be nearer 150 <sighs> members in the whole country. In the following decade, however, there would be another nationalist spectacular with lasting effects, led by a young, charismatic woman called Winnie Ewing. I'll leave you for now, though, with the moment when he realised that a huge shift in Scottish politics was taking place, with even old Labour men going back to their roots. When my father died, we just take it for granted I would wind up his estate, and lo and behold, I found a membership card of the Scottish National Party. Absolutely amazed. Although I shouldn't be, because he was a home ruler. So was he your biggest convert, do you think? Uh, probably. <laughs>